Dragon, smack, dope, whatever you call it, heroin has made a big comeback across the nation and the consequences have been fatal. According to the health department, in the last two years in New York City alone, 72% of all overdose deaths involved heroin. And for the past six years, overdose deaths have been on the rise dramatically. Next week, Metro Focus and PBS stations all across the state are teaming up with the New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services to bring awareness and hopefully an end to this ongoing scourge. Before that, a preview of sorts and a cautionary tale that is almost too incredible to believe. Federal prosecutor Andrew McKenna became a federal prisoner when he got lost in heroin addiction and wound up behind bars living alongside many of those he had actually convicted. McKenna chronicled that in his book, Sheer Madness, and I recently had a chance to talk with him. Andrew, thanks for joining us. I, I, I appreciate your spending the time. It's a great uh, pleasure. Thanks for having me. When you look at the first part of your resume, it reads military, JAG officer, federal prosecutor, and you think, impressive guy. And, and in meeting you and talking with you, I, th that reinforces that to me. Okay. And then you see, a little farther along on the resume, federal prisoner. How'd you get there? Paul Grandel, who writes for a paper in Albany, and he reviewed the book, and he had a great line that said, heroin doesn't read resumes. And for me, I had this massive fall from grace, and there are several reasons why. And it took a long time to figure these things out. Um, a lot of time sitting in group therapy, a lot of time in individual counseling. What happened was um, I started dabbling in prescription pain medicine following an injury in the Marine Corps. Um, I pretty much could have treated it with Motrin and heating pads and ice and that kind of thing, but I came to enjoy the feeling, the euphoria of the opiate. Uh, naturally, I have an addictive personality. It's something I've always had to keep an eye on. Did you realize that back then? That I, you had the addictive, or is this something that, that has become clear to you in retrospect? You know, I did know. I did know. I didn't know that something like opiates could send me down, down a path that I, that I never could have imagined, right? Because that was a game changer for me. You know, dabbling in marijuana and beer and stuff like that as a teenager, okay, that's one thing. I don't condone it. You know, I have stepdaughters, I don't condone it. But, you know, the opiates grab you in a way like no other drug can. And not only is it the psychological addiction as aspect of it, but it's the physical addiction. When you run out of opiates, you feel absolutely miserable. And I'm not just talking about Lortab, you know, and hydrocodone, oxycodone, but if you get into Oxycontin, which is what I did eventually, that's a completely different ball game. Did anybody see this happening with you? Did anybody, did anybody grab you and pull you aside and say, hey, Andrew, man, you know, you, you gotta slow down here. What was happening, I was, I was functioning at a very, very high level, which I write about in the book. Um, I was leading largely a double life. And, but as we know, you know, through, you know, addiction counselors and through common sense, that's really living that lifestyle as a house of cards. It's eventually going to come down. Um, and it did for me. And um, I ended up going through a difficult custody battle. Uh, after I left the Justice Department, we moved back to Albany, New York. I had two young sons. Um, I had a decent job, but the wheels were coming off the bus. And I couldn't find a doctor in New York to prescribe opiates at the level that I was sort of addicted to. And so I went to the street drug dealers, basically, through an old acquaintance, and uh, found OxyContin for the first time. And that was just a, a game changer. I remember sitting in uh, an office, pouring down sweat, you know, on the verge of vomiting in my waist, uh, you know, basket, because I couldn't get any more OxyContin. And eventually I turned to heroin. It's a common story. It's a tragic story because I was able to pull out of it, but not until I did 65 months in federal prison for bank robberies. Let, let me talk about sure. that. Sure. Because I, I think, and, and it's a fascinating book. I want people to read it. And, and you're very open and candid. But it, it, before you said that, people were probably watching us and listening and saying, okay, here's a guy, you know, had a great future and great talent, got involved in this heroin, you know, probably lost his job, probably, you know, maybe even, you know, falsified some prescriptions. 
you got involved in bank robbery. Right. And this is where the page sort of turns, um, where my story is different from the guy who just gets addicted and goes to rehab and gets better or doesn't get better. Um, I went through, as I mentioned, a bad custody battle, continuous setbacks, and I fell into a deep, deep depression. Um, the setbacks that I got in family court were 99 percent my fault. Right. Um, but I couldn't see them. And it broke my heart. Um, so during a period of anger on my way to family court, instead of going to family court where I knew I would get another setback, you know, maybe get to see them, you know, once every two months or something like that, um, I drove north and I robbed the bank. Now, now you say that. Let me, let me stop. You. Yes. Drove north and I robbed the bank. Right. How does that happen? How do, you who, who were a, a, a JAG officer, a federal prosecutor, you're a smart guy, obviously, you're a personable guy. What makes you say, I'm going to go rob a bank? There was some disconnect in my mind, and it's so difficult for me to explain it. You know, I needed money, clearly, um, but there were other options, right? Um, I'm not a sociopath. Um, I'm not you know, clinically insane or deranged. So I don't know. I don't know what happened when I passed that exit and should have gone to Saratoga Family Court and instead drove to Lake George. But something clicked in my mind or didn't click in my mind. And um, the, the memory is, is both vivid and blurry at the same time. Um, and is it, it, is it almost like when you think about it, you're watching a movie? Is it somebody else you see doing this? It's exactly right. And it's almost like it's that weird filter on a camera where the colors are just off a little bit. Um, and that's that's my memory of it. And it was almost like I was in a trance like state. Um, and, I, you know, I travel the country now talking to different groups and I talk about, you know, the dangers of prescription drug use, just use, not abuse. You know, but how that use can turn into abuse and then ultimately can lead to heroin or more dangerous things. Um, but one of the things I talk about is that point of me going past my family court hearing and, and doing what I did. And the message is sort of like, be aware, be super self-aware of what you're going through in your life. Talk to people, ask for help because help is there. And the students are receptive to it. After I speak for 40 minutes, we go on for 30 minutes for Q&A. So again, the book is called Sheer Madness, From Federal Prosecutor to Federal Prisoner. Andrew, a harrowing life story, but it, it sounds like you're on the way to a good ending. If I, if I can help others, that's, therein lies the redemption. So, Andrew McKenna, thanks for spending some time. Good luck to you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.